Danny today, Eddie might change it around. I mean, so, you know.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here to Bangor Mission Church this morning. Uh, my name's Eddie, you don't know who I am. I'm the assistant pastor, and I'm going to be leading us through uh, our service uh, this morning. We're going to be taking the Lord's Supper a little bit later. We're going to be singing together, and Paul is going to be bringing God's Word to us uh, in a little while in a new um, sermon series, uh, Jesus the Greatest Gift. So um, why don't I pray for us as we open up and start our service together, and then we're going to, um, we're going to read from God's Word. Father God, we give you thanks for bringing us once again uh, together to worship you, to praise your name, and to be encouraged and fed by your words. Lord, we pray that your spirit will be working in us, in each of us right now, Lord. You know where we are, you know what our weeks have been like, you know what we're struggling with and what we're encouraged by. We pray, Lord, that you will be speaking to us through each part of this service today, and that you will be speaking to us through each other as well, as we get together and enjoy time together. So we pray that we will be ready for the week ahead, and that we will be trusting and clinging to you always. Amen. Uh, we're going to start by reading Psalm 106 together. It's going to come up on the screen. Uh, screen. We're going to just read the first two verses, so please do read along with me. Praise the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord, or declare all his praise? Well, we're going to sing our first song now. Uh, we just read of God's goodness and his steadfast love. And that steadfast love was shown most prominently through taking on flesh, emptying himself and becoming a servant so that he could reconcile us to himself. So let's sing Joy is Dawned Upon the World.
While we've sung to God, we're going to now um, pray to him. I'm going to lead us in prayer together. Um, so please do uh, close your eyes, focus on, uh, focus on who we are praying to, and uh, let me pray. <laughs> Father God, we praise you that we can come near to you in prayer and song, that we are able to know you through your word and be reminded of your mighty works day by day. We thank you, Lord, that you created and sustained the world by your works, that there is nothing you are not sovereign over, that you know the number of stars in the sky, the grains of sand on the shore, and the hairs on our heads. Lord, we thank you that you know us. You know when we wake up and when we go to sleep, when we're at work and when we're praising you. You know us in our happiest times and when we're at our worst. You knew us before we were born, and you'll be with us throughout our entire lives. And Father, we thank you that before the world was created, you chose us in mercy to know you and call out to you for salvation. Father, you have gathered us together as your people. You have gathered us and united us in one body and one spirit, with one Lord, one faith, one baptism, with one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. In that unity, we are called to demonstrate your glory and your goodness, and we praise you. But Lord, there are times when we do not do that. There are times when we rebel or reject what we know, when we give in to our sinful hearts and into temptation. There are times when we don't trust your goodness and instead put our trust in something else, thinking that it makes a better God and a better Saviour. Lord, we acknowledge and repent of our sin. We think about those times that we have failed to glorify you this week. Lord, forgive us. Wash us clean through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that sin no longer has any hold on us, that its sting and victory have been taken away, and death is no longer something to fear. We thank you for the resurrection your victory over death and the hope of resurrection for those who believe and trust in your Son. We pray, Father, that we would meet, uh, meditate on that hope, and as we do, you would continue to work in our hearts, helping us to cling tightly to you as Saviour, rather than anything this world offers. Father, we pray for our church. We pray that you would use us to be a light in this community, that as we love and serve one another, we would be assigned to your glory. We pray that we would not point to ourselves, but instead to Christ and what he has done for this world. We pray that we would be a family that loves to welcome new members and show kindness and compassion to those who need your love. We thank you for the ladies' carol service on Friday night. We pray that those who are there who don't know you, we pray that through your spirit you would have spoken to them in Amy's words and gotten them to consider who you are and their relationship with you and would want to learn more of their <laughs> Saviour. We pray for the other events this month and that you would work powerfully to save. We pray for our church family. We pray particularly for those who are grieving. We pray for the Thorntons after Betty's funeral on Thursday. We pray that you would be constantly reminding them of your goodness and the joy of knowing Betty is with you where it is better by far as they miss her and are reminded of their loss over the next few weeks and months. We pray they would also be able to show this hope to the rest of the family and that you would be working in them to come to a living trust in you. We pray for the church family too, for those who have known Betty for a long, long time and miss her. Help us to comfort and encourage one another. Finally, Father, we pray for our world. As we look around at the brokenness, the conflict, the selfishness and the greed, all the marks of our sin. We pray that Christ would return soon and put these things right. We pray for the authorities and leaders in Paris as they respond to the attack that took place last night. We pray for the family of the person who was killed and for those who are in hospital injured. We continue to pray for an end to the conflicts in our world, particularly for the people of Israel, Gaza and Ukraine. We pray for justice, we pray for repentance, we pray for leaders to work to save life rather than take it. Lord, we thank you that you are able to we are Lord, we thank you that we are able to approach you in prayer, knowing that you hear our prayers and listen to us. 
We thank you that it gives you joy to hear your children talking to you. We pray that you, your will will be done rather than ours, and we entrust ourselves to you. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. It's time for the kids to head out to crash. So should we all say goodbye to them as they, uh, as they head out? Bye, guys. See you next. Have fun. <laughs> um, the rest of us here, we're going to um, carry on with our catechism now. Um, we are, um, we're gonna, I'm going to ask the next question, and then we're going to read the answer together. So I believe the question is going to be on the screen. There it is. So I'm going to ask us, where is Christ now? And we're going to say the answer together. Christ rose bodily from the grave on the third day after his death and is seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling his kingdom and interceding for us until he returns to judge and renew the whole world. Uh, it is important for us to know that none of these questions and answers are made up. It isn't just what some people think. Um, it is all from the Bible. So we're going to read a part of the Bible now that helps us um, understand uh, this, this truth that we've just um, said together. So we're going to read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 to 21 together. He raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Uh, we're going to watch a video now to explain the answer to that question just a little bit more. No doubt you've heard the phrase, out of sight, out of mind. That someone who's not around, who you haven't seen in a long time, doesn't have much impact or relevance in your day-to-day -day life. The Bible tells us that after Jesus' resurrection, he ascended into heaven, disappearing from view, out of sight. But we're also told that because of where he now resides, we can be assured that he's very relevant in our daily lives. So where is Jesus now? He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. But what difference does that make to us in our day-to-day -day lives? Well, first, it reminds us that Jesus rules over all creation. Psalm 110 paints this beautiful picture where all of God's enemies are a footstool of Jesus as he sits at the Father's right hand. Can you see the comfort of that in your daily life? when you're struggling with discouragement or disappointment or even bitterness about the way your life is going? Or when you're discouraged and angry at all the injustice and evil in the world and like David in Psalm 37, you're tempted to say, why do the wicked seem to flourish? In those moments, consider where Jesus is now. He's at the right hand of God the Father. See him there. Enemies his footstool. The one who conquered death is now ruling the world. And we're told in Ephesians 1 that Jesus was given all authority and will one day return and make the crooked places straight. So let where Jesus is now give you hope and courage to trust and follow him, the one whose enemies are already his footstool. But there's even more. Not only is Jesus the king who rules, but he is the priest who intercedes. Hebrews 10 tells us that Jesus is the great high priest who on the cross offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice for sin. And he is now interceding and praying for us at the Father's right hand. He is our advocate in every sense of that word. So to see Jesus at God's right hand as our high priest is to remember that there is no condemnation for our sin. That Jesus sacrificed himself so that we could be united with him. We have the full rights, therefore, as God's children. So yes, Jesus is out of sight. We can't physically see him. But he is active in our day-to-day -day lives and in this world at the right hand of God the Father, ruling as our king, interceding as our priest, and waiting to return when he will wipe away every tear, beat swords into plowshares, and flood the world with his glory and grace. In a few moments, we're going to be sharing at the Lord's table together. Uh, we're going to be visually declaring the gospel to one another as we take the bread, Christ's body broken for us, and then the juice, his blood shed for us, so that we might be forgiven, and so that 
what he's just talked about on the video, that hope that one day Christ will return, make all things right, and where we will see his glory forever will be true for us. And until that day, we know that he is reigning, that he is on his throne by, on his father's side, and that there is not anything that happens in this world that he does not know about, and that he is with us always. So let's think about that as we think about our servant king who came to sacrifice for our fall and is now looking after us and watching over us day by day.
we're going to take the Lord's Supper in a minute. Um, so it's good and right for us, I think, to prepare our hearts uh, for what we're about to do. So I'm going to pray for us. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we gather at the Lord's table, we must recall the promises and warnings given to us in the Scriptures. Let us therefore examine ourselves and repent of our sins. Let us give thanks to God for his redemption of the world through his Son, Jesus Christ. And as we remember Christ's death for us and receive this pledge of his love, let us resolve to serve him in holiness and righteousness. Let's pray. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in what we have thought and in what we have said and what we have done. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us for what we have done, and lead us out of darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Amen. Uh, hear what John said in 1 John chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will have, you will have not sin, so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's go, Neil and Trevor to come up and help me with there. <coughs> Neil, uh, Neil's going to pray for us. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that you left your throne above uh, in heaven. We thank you that you came to dwell among us. And you revealed to yourself to us in the form of your son, Jesus. You came as that humble servant. We just thank the Lord for the life that he lived uh, that was completely sinless. And we just thank the Lord that he took upon himself all our sins. We thank you that Jesus is the light of the, of the world that shines in the darkness and has overcome the, uh, the power of sin, the penalty of sin, and ultimately, the presence of sin. Mm. We just thank the Lord that you've done that uh, for us because of your love. We just thank the Lord that you've done it because <clears throat> we couldn't do it ourselves. We thank you, Lord, for that wonderful act of self-sacrifice self and love as Jesus hung upon the cross and was separated from you, his heavenly Father, as all the sins of the whole world hung upon him. But we just thank you, Lord, that he defeated sin and death and hell once and for all. We thank you, Lord, that he has ascended into heaven and reigns victorious and is alive today. We just thank the Lord that we have that hope uh, of future uh, eternal life if we come in repentance of our sins and just trust uh, humbly and in faith in what Jesus has done for us. Please be with us now, Lord, as we take this uh, bread and this cup. Help us, Lord, to meditate and to, to celebrate as well the true sacrifice that Jesus made. And we just pray you help us not to take this for granted, never to take it lightly and to do it until Jesus returns. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to take the meal together now. Uh, this is an important reminder for all Christians, um, as we are reminded of our need of Christ. Uh, we have examined our hearts. Uh, if there is sin in our lives that we need to repent of, it's right that we do this before the Lord's Supper, because this is a sign of our communion and fellowship with God. Also, if we're not in good communion with somebody in the church, in our family, it is also right that we deal with that conflict too, as this is a sign of our unity with each other. The Bible takes this meal very seriously. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. It's important that we approach God rightly, that is, in Christ, because he is our saviour and our mediator. Uh, if you do not wish to take the Lord's Supper, you can just let the elements, which just means the bread and the wine, pass you by. There's no judgment here, no, no one will look at you. It is better for us to be honest with where we're at and with God. Uh, the bread is going to be shared out now by, uh, by Trevor and Neil. Um, you can take the bread and then um, wait, and then we can all take it together. Thank you.
Listen to what the Apostle Paul said. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat. We're now going to um, pass out the wine here at the juice. Uh, again, just wait until it's um, been fully passed out and then we can uh, take it together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let's drink. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray, and we'll gather the air. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We are going to um, gather the, the cup back together, so just have those ready to go, if that's okay. And um, we're going to get ready to sing again. We take the Lord's Supper knowing that the only reason it is possible for us to do so, to be able to approach God at all and eat at his table, nonetheless, is because what Jesus has done for us. He is all we have. So let's sing that truth.
Just a few uh, notices for you now. Uh, firstly, Kay wanted me to pass on um, thanks from all of us at Bangkok, for all those who helped on Friday night with the uh, with the ladies' carol service, especially the men. I was told you were great. Get us proud. Um, so thank you so much for all your help. I think it was sounded like an absolutely great night. When Kat came home, she just said it was really, really, really good and really fun. Um, so thank you for your help, and, and let's pray that God uses it uh, to glorify Himself. Um, also. Uh, the Thorntons wanted to uh, pass on their thanks. Uh, they've sent us a card, which uh, you can come and, and read if you like. Um, I will read it for you now. It just says, to our church family, just wanted to say, I uh, just want to thank everyone for your love, prayers, and practical help. We are so grateful with love from the Thorntons. Um, so thank you very much, guys, and we love you very much too. Um, the only other things to really point out are, are what we've been, uh, what are coming up. So it's the ladies' party tomorrow. It's, it's 2.15. Uh, so uh, just to say no. <laughs> I'm going to have to look, start looking at these parts. Half 12. It is a half 12 in here. Um, and uh, please do invite people uh, along to that as well, hopefully. Um, we have our small groups uh, as usual at 745 at uh, Dartford Drive. Is football on? Yeah, should be. Cool, excellent. Uh, and again, the small group uh, on Wednesday at 2 o'clock here in the church. And then Friday, there's no youth group on Friday. Instead, we've got the men's Christmas meal, which I think is fully booked. I don't know if we can do anything. Yeah, fully booked. Fully booked. We need to be um, sat by seven. Sorry? We need to be sat. At the table we need to be seven. sat at the table by seven o'clock. So get there at like quarter to seven. Or Trevor will be on you. <laughs> uh, and then just uh, just the Christmas services. We have uh, we have Holly Court um, coming up uh, on the on the 12th at, at quarter to eight. Uh, the family carol service on the 17th at four o'clock and then Sunday the 24th and Christmas morning are at 10.30, not at 11 o'clock. Paul gave me a thumbs up. <laughs> um, uh, we're starting, as I said at the beginning, a, a short Christmas se sermon series, thinking about Christ, uh, the greatest gift. Uh, Christ came into the world that he uh, created, full of grace and truth, because God so loved the world. Uh, we're going to sing that now. And then Paul is going to come and uh, come and read John chapter 3, verses 1 to 21, and preach God's word to us. <coughs> Let's sing.
seated. And uh, do turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3. I had planned to read verses 1 to 21, uh, as Eddie said, but we're going to read just from verse 16 uh, to 21. You can follow in the, in the church Bible if you're using that. I'll just give you the page number when I get there. Uh, so we're on page... Uh, uh, 887 in John chapter 3, actually 888, as we're going to pick up at verse 16 and uh, read to verse 21. We'll make refer reference to the opening verses uh, that we have there, but we're focus, our focus this morning is, uh, well, it's verse 16 really, in terms of the theme that we're following, Jesus, the greatest gift. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it might be clearly seen that his works have been carried uh, out in God. John chapter 3 verse 16 is probably the best known verse uh, in the whole of the Bible. Certainly there would have been a generation growing up that would have known that. Maybe more recently that's less than the case. But John 3 16 certainly would have been well acquainted with in some people's hearts and minds. I do remember watching the kind of sporting events on the television, particularly the World Cup, but there were other events. And if it was football, then behind the goal, uh, there would be somebody holding John 3.16. Not the whole text, just the, uh, the chapter and verse. So I guess you had to have a knowledge and uh, where did that come from and uh, potentially look it up. But there was this statement that was being made within that sporting world. God's love, and that's what we're thinking about this morning. But what does love mean? We've got uh, poems and songs and films. Uh, they've all been produced either containing this word or it's about this word in one way or another. There used to be an advertising campaign uh, for the sweet uh, chocolate Rolo. Do you love anybody enough to give them your last Rolo? Uh, I don't know if you do. Uh, if you like that chocolate or any other chocolate for the matter, uh, that matter. Do you love somebody enough that you've got one last bit? Oh, you can have it. There are all sorts of demonstrations and displays and examples as to what love might mean. But we're going to look and see what does God mean, or what does love mean for God, and that being the case, what does it mean for us? One writer called this verse, the Bible in miniature. Others have said this is the, the golden text. But here we have a statement about God and what he is going to do and what he has done. If you've started uh, the devotional book, Comfort and Joy, if you haven't, you're three days behind, and you will be in trouble if I find out. No, you've got, uh, we're on day three now, um, but today one of the, the questions that the author asks is, does God care? And then he develops uh, something of that nature from the text that he's looking at. We might say, well, does God care? How does he show that he cares? Well, he shows it in this text. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's how much he cares about humanity. In chapter 3, we 
had the story of Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night and he's been asking him some questions and he's full of uh, those questions and uh, well, how, what does it mean to be in relationship with God basically? And Jesus speaks about being born again. Well, how can you be born again? And Nicodemus, this uh, ruler, this man of the Old Testament scriptures, and Jesus says to him, really, you should know because you're a man that knows the Old Testament. And so we've been introduced to Nicodemus, and then we're brought into this text, which is not necessarily part of the conversation with Nicodemus, but John employs it because I think what he's doing is he's beginning to identify, well, you've got the questions of Nicodemus and other questions that are to come from others. What and who is going to be the answer to all of those things? Well, it's the provision of God in Jesus. That's the answer, and that's part of of this text this morning that we're going to be looking at. And there's a little bit of a link, and many uh, writers pick it up, as uh, in uh, verse 14 and 15, uh, Jesus uh, is speaking to Nicodemus about his death, as Moses lifted up the servant, so uh, the servant, so the son of man must be lifted up. I've got to be lifted up, I'm going to die. But also, the sense in verse 17, that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, he sent his son. So there's something of the incarnation. So death and incarnation linked together. This is the birth, this is the death of Jesus Christ. You see, as we go through these Christmas events, if we don't get to the death, if we don't get to death and resurrection, then there's no hope. And so we're gonna get there every time. And we get it here with this great gift. And that is the first point. Three things we're going to talk about this morning on this text, John 3.16. And the first thing, it is a great gift. I'm not too sure what you consider a great gift to be. I do remember one Christmas, I was, uh, I was about uh, 12, I had full expectation, what am I going to get for Christmas? And uh, it's all under the tree and I came down. My mum is very practical. What does she buy me for Christmas? Well, uh, all those generations ago, if you went to church, you all got dressed smartly. I mean, it doesn't really matter now. But so they, they bought me for Christmas a sports jacket. If you don't know what a sports jacket is, it's a kind of a tweedy thing. And uh, it's all very smart and you get a shirt and tie. And I opened it. Oh, I didn't complain. Thought, well, yeah. I don't know why I didn't complain, but anyway, um, I thought, oh, yeah, well, okay. Uh, and then there was something else, very practical. And uh, what I wanted was maybe a, a new pair of uh, Steve Highway football boots or somebody of that nature, and I'd get a sports jacket. It wasn't a great gift, as far as I was concerned. So what do you consider a great gift to be? I guess if you ask the recipient of an organ transplant, uh, then whatever else they may receive, nothing could really exceed that, that somebody has gifted them whatever it takes. If it's measured in terms of material things, then that could be something of great financial cost, or it's something that's just given out of genuine and sincere love. might not cost a lot, but it's, it's what's behind that gift. And that's what we tell our kids, or did. It's what's behind the gift. Don't worry, we don't spend a lot. It's what's behind it. It's all, it comes with all of our love. Here we focus on the source of perfect love. God and his pronouncement. The Old Testament reader would have been very aware that God loves a nation. God loves Israel. Of course he loves us. We're told in the Old Testament that that's exactly uh, why he chose them. I chose you not because you were a great nation and you had a lot going for you. I chose you because I loved you. So Israel, the Jewish people, were pretty well sure that God loved them. And God loved them and chose them for good reason. He had a covenant with them. But out of this nation, eventually, there's going to come a king. Kings will come, but the greatest king will come. So this nation is significantly important. The fact that they were recipients of God's love and often took it for granted and saw it as being exclusive, rather God intended something greater. He always intended that the nations were to come in. God loves the world. The worksheet uh, today for the, for the children 
we've identified a, a few countries and they've got to find out what those countries are. And the point of doing that is to understand that God loves the nations, not just one particular piece of land or a piece of geography, but God loves his world, the nations within it. And even in the Old Testament, there are hints that God loves the nations. He will go to Nineveh through Jonah, and other foreigners will come in and be part of the kingdom of God. And so, this gift is the gift of love, and its greatness is determined in the phrase that's used in the text, that is his one and only son. That's what makes it amazing and great, his one and only son. There were many things in heaven. There were the angels in heaven. They were often tasked to go and speak to Abraham or Moses or Samuel or somebody else, whoever it might be. The messengers, messengers would come. But none of those angels in heaven would be tasked with this mission, would, be, would qualify for this work. The mission of bringing a rebellious, undeserving humanity into relationship with God called for a unique and ultimate gift, Christ the one and only Son. He is given this duty and this task and does so willingly and submissively. But it's also great because of those who are the recipients of this love. It's great because of the gift, Jesus, but it's great also because of those that receive this love. We tend to work on a, um, a work-based behavior, don't we? It's basically, if you're good, you'll get this. Uh, we try not to do that, but we do it. And so our children grow up thinking, well, I've just got to behave and I'll get that nice gift. Fortunately, that's not how God works. Because nobody would really be good enough to know God's love and to be part of his family. One of the questions on the uh, worksheet uh, for the children is, why should God love us? Now, I don't want you to answer that, but think about it in your head for a moment. What's your answer to that question? Why should God love me? Well, I'm not too bad. I'm quite a personable character. I'm not perfect, I know that, but, you know, I get on fairly well with any, uh, 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 most people. And uh, I'm sure I've got some very good characteristics and... Uh, I'm sure God looks on those and he sees all those nice things. So maybe that's why God should, should love me. I'm quite attractive. Well, I was once, I think. <laughs> At least to one woman, anyway. Uh, so, uh, well, God should love me. If that's your answer to that question, I'm not correcting the worksheets, but that's wrong. Nobody deserves God's love. In fact, the rest of the text goes on to speak about God's judgment and God's condemnation, because actually that's what we all deserve. So, one writer says, God's love is to be admired not because the world is so big and includes many people, but because the world is so bad. And indeed, Jesus says that God, uh, or rather the scriptures tell us that God shows his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, we were at our worst, our, our most ugly. We're waiting for a makeover. And the only makeover that is going to be acceptable is to be in Christ. So whenever we get this Advent season, there's nothing greater or more amazing than this gift. This is the one above all others. Jesus told a parable about a man who found some riches in a field. It wasn't his field, but he found riches because he was allowed to be looking in it for some reason anyway. It doesn't really matter, but it, as soon as he found them, he went home and he sold absolutely everything that he had and he went and bought the field. 
Whatever we think this world has to offer, it can never satisfy, but this gift can. And Jesus will say in another place, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can man give in return for his soul? This is the greatest gift. Whatever society might think is good and satisfying, there are many things there, but nothing compares to this one because it answers the questions of eternal life, as we will see. The second thing that we've got here in this text is it's a great gift, it's a one and only son, but the second thing is it's a sacrificial gift. There's been an image doing the rounds on social media which shares the message there is only one Black Friday that offers eternal savings. It's a play on, of course, the recent uh, uh, Friday uh, where apparently you can uh, get amazing offers in shops and you can't afford to miss them. Really, you need to be there and you need to buy on Black Friday. So, on another Friday, Christ then gives his life to ensure the knowledge that sins can be forgiven. The greatest saving goes on. The greatest salvation is on display so that you and I can be in a right standing with God. But you have to note, though, that there is a giving God gave. There is a cost. It's not free. It's a free gift to you and me in that sense. We can't buy it. We can't work for it. But it still costs. It costs heaven. It costs God giving his son, and it costs the son coming to give his life. This God and all his fullness, the creator God, the one that has put stars in space, the cattle on a thousand hills are his. Every part of the universe comes under his rule and jurisdiction. Of all that he could give to a people, he gives the most precious thing, and that is his one and only but there is an element of sacrificial language in that little phrase, gave, he gave. Something had to be sacrificed to deal with sin. It was always the case. The Old Testament, time and again, lambs and bullocks and whatever else were, were, would be given to cover the sin of the people, but it was ongoing. It had to keep being done. And God had put that in place. So it did something at the time, but it was always going to be inefficient in the long term. It was always pointing some for, towards something that would be fully satisfying and answer every situation. It would be the final sacrifice, and that is in Jesus Christ. And so the sacrifice is given, and the sacrifice is made. And it is the second person of the Trinity. It is the Son of God. So the Hebrew, or the book of the Hebrews rather, helps us to understand this Old Testament imagery and what Jesus does. He says this, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. It deals just with a, a moment in time. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made uh, a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sacrifi uh, sanctified. One offering covers everything, and you know, and it's often been said, there was one piece of furniture that wasn't in the temple, and that was a chair, because a priest never stopped working. There was always another sacrifice. But this high priest sits down in heaven because it's all finished. We don't need anything else. The king has done his work. God gave everything he had. Christ submitted to everything that he had to do. The perfect law, the perfect law-keeping life, sacrifice, so you and I can know the righteousness of Jesus. Wesley, the hymn writer, put it this way. 
He says, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress. Midst flaming worlds in these arrayed, with joy I shall lift up my head. Bold shall I stand in that great day, for who ought to my charge shall lay, fully absolved through these I am from sin and fear, from guilt and shame because Christ has given us his righteousness. We have repented of our sin, but he's given us his righteousness. And so, before God, we stand perfect. I can be bold, the hymn writer says. You see, if you haven't got the righteousness of Christ, we're going to quake before the judgment of the king. You've got it here in this text. Uh, when it speaks about judgment and men loving light, uh, darkness rather than light, they are going to be judged and it's their own selves that will judge them in the end because they have decided they, will, they want to be in darkness and they don't want light. May you know light today. May you know God's goodness. Last thing as we finish this morning is we have a purposeful gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I'm not sure of the stat, but apparently a lot of gifts gets returned uh, after Christmas. Some because it's the wrong size and you need to get something different. Uh, but be others because they're just not wanted. Other gifts gets recycled. The person doesn't want it, rewraps it for next year and gives it to someone else. Dangerous game. Make sure you don't give it back to the same person that gave it to you in the first place. Um, but they get recycled. I would never do that. I don't know whether I've been the recipient of a recycled gift. But people give them back. They don't want them. It doesn't have purpose for them. This gift is ready-made to meet humanity's greatest need. We're sinners. Sin separates us from God. We can't do anything about our sin, no matter how hard we try. And that being the case, we are condemned. All of us. Condemned before God because we're sinners and he cannot look on sin. And the right judgment then is passed upon us. And we should be cast out of his presence. That really is the right and proper thing in the eyes of a holy God to do to humanity. It is a fearful state to be in. But provision is made to meet that need. We have this gift of purpose. Jesus has come and taken sin so that we might know the blessing of heaven. It's the hope that we expressed on Thursday and every time we come to an occasion like that when a believer dies in Christ. There is a hope a hope of heaven and glory, the wonder held out through King Jesus. And so here this morning, there's this glorious gift of eternal life for those who will believe. So, will you come today in faith, simply trusting that King Jesus will be part of your life? Will you come in repentance, confessing your sin? Here's the gift that will meet all your needs. Well, it will meet your greatest need. And that's sin, and that's the work of Satan, and that's death. Those are your greatest needs. Not whether you've got enough money in the bank, that's something that we do worry about sometimes. Your greatest need is what relationship are you in before God? So here we are this morning, and what a gift. What a gift of love from the Father. The hymn writer goes this way, Here is love, vast as an ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood, who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise. He can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. How deep the Father's love? We're going to sing that in just a few moments. 
But I hope this little text and the surrounding uh, narrative just demonstrates the glory and the wonder of God's love to his world. Well, you come and let me come and revel afresh in everything that God has given. Let's grasp, maybe for the first time, his wonderful glory. Or if we know it, to remind ourselves of it. May God help us. Let's pray and then we're going to sing. Our loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for who you are, and we want to thank you for your amazing love and your great gift. We thank you that you'll always do right. You will always do right as you welcome in and as you make judgment, because you are God. And so we pray this morning that you'll help us to know that Christ is King of our hearts and lives and we worship you. Amen. Let's sing then uh, our final hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, How Vast Beyond Should Measure, That He Should Give His Only Son to Make a Wretch His Treasure. We're the wretches, but we can be a treasure. Let's stand and let's sing uh, our, this hymn together, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Let's stand. loving Heavenly Father, we do want to praise and thank you that we are able to be here today 
to honour your, uh, honor your name and sing praise to you. Gracious God, we ask that you may watch over us and that you will help us to respond to your word. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Let's be seated. Reminder of the refreshments that are served through in the back hall. Do stay for those. Thank you.